the two thirty. I so, see. Okay. So do, do you want to try your Do you want to try your screen? Yeah. Just concentrating on this. My computer wants me to to install something. <laughs> I should not do that because otherwise you need to wait one hour. Yeah, always the wrong time, right? <laughs> no, actually, I, I wanted to uh, that they delay it, the IT this morning, and they said, yeah, yeah, we delayed it to tomorrow. And uh, you see the result. Well, it was asking again for it. <laughs> so they didn't do a good job. Okay. So, you see this? Oh, it's fantastic. Looks very, very good. Do you want to try your pointer? Yeah. Uh, is it? this guy huh there yeah very good yeah very very good oh there so so when, when you have the new when you have the new synchrotron i mean besides yeah. the improvement besides the improvement of the synchrotron itself uh, will you be able to expect that uh, you're going to upgrade your spectrometer again using this uh, time uh, yeah, so I, I, I have uh, written a funding proposal for doing that, actually. I, I will get news in a month from now if we get this one. Uh, so you, you extend the resolution better to, to improve the resolution? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. We want to, uh, to, to, to be uh, in front of the, of the others again. So we want oh, to oh you, 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 you want to be so you want leading to be, again. Uh, you want to be the Brookhaven guy? So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> the, one, the, the one guy was my student, the other one my postdoc. I want to beat them once more before I go and retire. <laughs> I see. I see. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. So we, we should we should keep going. Uh, you need money. If I don't get money, I cannot do. It. I do how, how much? How much you think it cost? Uh... So a spectrometer maybe cost three million. Oh, that's not that much. Three million. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. But for synchrotron, uh, it's regarded much. But yeah, I, I, give I mean, you neutron, right. neutron, neutron spectrometer costs fifteen million a piece, twenty million a piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so three, three million so, is pretty cheap, yeah. Yeah, we we are, we are cheap guys, right? <laughs> You're cheap guys. <laughs> you, you 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 should explain that to 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 our, I, I review, our I, I should, You should you should suggest me as a reviewer. I review a lot of proposals for the uh, for the Swiss Foundation. I actually I couldn't name you know who I reviewed for, but I mean I reviewed many. No, many. Uh, unfortunately, you know. Oh, we have paper can... together, right? We have... no, maybe no, that's no. A... maybe they would anyway quick you, but I cannot suggest you because they have no way to suggest. The only thing you can do is you can um, uh, 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 exclude people which uh, might have conflict of interest. <laughs> I see. Oh, you cannot. So suggest. you can just a hand, maximum handful of people you can exclude. Mm -hmm, which you mm -hmm. think they would have severe conflict of interest, I which see. would be a problem. But positive suggestions you're not allowed to make. I see. So, yeah, I reviewed, I reviewed quite, for quite a few proposals. I mean, I can see how rich Swiss people are, right? Because, uh, you know, they, they write how much money they get, you know, for a proposal that uh, we, we struggling in the U.S. try to get, you know, half of that. Yeah. I'm, uh, actually, in the, in the Swiss proposal system now, it is quite large what you can ask for. <clears throat> but... Uh, you cannot ask for many proposals. You can only have one running proposal. I so, see. So, so that's why it is so large. So one needs to kind of uh, make a complex planning for uh, always a couple of people uh, which you want to have for, for a period of four years. You should, you should, Tosin, you should, you should thank uh, Tomo Yumura. Tomo, Tomo, get up at three o'clock in the morning to attend your meeting. Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. He's, he's in Japan. He, he got up at like three o'clock in the morning to, to hear your talk. <laughs> okay, good, great. <laughs> yeah. So I'm honored. <laughs> yeah, you, sh you should be, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, this is all, this is all, all magic that you zoom now, so we, we can. It's, 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 it's very, very nice. Actually, I, I think the audience that the, the, the covered, let me, let me tell my students that they, they should show up <laughs> for this because uh, a lot of times they, they forgot. Yeah, I, I have the Slack thing to just tell them. Uh, yeah, it's, it's much more much more powerful. You have a lot of attendance, uh, really senior people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but but your seminar series has got now extremely famous, so everybody knows it. So everybody knows it. <laughs> people want to. Yeah. yeah. I, I actually, to be honest, I've never been turned down by anybody. <laughs> everybody I've invited, they always wanted to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But uh, I mean, it, it, the, the people uh, uh, log in, right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch it's it. very nice. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is happy when one has a chance to speak.
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, yeah, we don't, we don't have we don't have enough slots yeah, to get people to submit. Mm -hmm. Let's wait like one or two more minutes. Yeah, before before more people show up. Oh, we was not there yet. It was like two minutes from from uh, twelve thirty uh, two thirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a good platform. I I yeah. I mean, I invited it mostly focus on you know the, a lot of the scattering. And people complain to me. I invite too many scatters. It's me all complain to me. I invited too many scatters. Why did you complain? <laughs> I said, well, I appreciate that's, it. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, I invited two more neutron, neutron scatter. Yeah, scatter. Scattering <laughs> is extremely powerful. I know, I know. That, well, I mean, I, I figure, right? <laughs> I, I, I have not invited any, any neutron right. scatter. I haven't invited Tomo, but Tomo, yeah, maybe Tomo should give a talk at some point, right? <laughs> yeah, he, he's organizing. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a great setting to mix up with the spectroscopy community. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Andres, yeah. Maybe let's wait one more minute, okay, Posen? Sure, yeah. Whatever you say, you're the boss. Oh, I'm not the boss. <laughs> you, you, you do all the work. I just invite like people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe, okay. Yeah, yeah, I let, see. Let, okay. Let, let, yeah. Let, let's get started. Yeah. So, so, so I mean, people will join in as you the talk. Right? We're extremely happy. Exactly. To have, yeah, Tosin, Tosin Smith to talk about the. Uh, uh, the the sort of uh, the angle uh, uh, yeah you know momentum energy resolved in elastic X-ray scattering, and and Rick's actually has a tremendous advantage compared with the uh, neutron scattering in the sense that the neutron scattering, you know our energy resolution is better, but the neutron scattering you know we we have to look at a sample like thirty grams, and uh, whereas uh, whereas uh, Tosin can look at a sample like you know thirty milligrams, so so that has a huge advantage as he will demonstrate you know for example we did the uh, irons. Iron selenide, you know, when we glue the iron selenide on the uh, bearing one to two, we can only look at low energy stuff with neutrons because the background overwhelms the signal of RICS, where uh, overwhelms the signal of neutrons. Whereas, uh, you know, Torsen can actually look at the uh, RICS and he can just move the spot. He can look at the, either the substrate or the sample, you know, by, by you know, moving like uh, three, four millimeters of the sample. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's extremely happy to have uh, Torsen here. Yeah. It's all yours, Torsen. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Peng Cheng, yeah. for inviting me for this uh, really, really nice uh, and exciting uh, seminar series. I'm really honored to, to, to speak in this seminar series. And uh, uh, Peng Cheng basically uh, gave me a task to, to, to not have just one topic, uh, uh, but to give more uh, what is meant here now, uh, an overview about resonant dynastic X-ray scattering in quantum materials and really demonstrate um, what you can learn uh, with this technique for, for, for different materials and what kind of uh, information you get and what, what, what things you, you, you can tackle in different projects. So, so from this, I uh, was assembling the following outline. So I will start off with introducing basically momentum resolved uh, soft X-ray resonant elastic X-ray scattering, uh, RIGS. Uh, uh, introduce that to you, what it is for the ones who, who don't know about this technique so well. Then I introduce further uh, the response of rigs and uh, what you can do in, in terms of momentum and energy resolution of the, uh, of the uh, excitations in the systems. I, I will give a, a case of a spin chain cube crater, uh, which we studied in the early days with rigs as uh, basically a warm up. Uh, and then I will uh, tackle kind of four different uh, uh, scientific uh, subjects. So I will uh, talk about to hold up cuprate superconductors and uh, we'll show you how you can <clears throat> disentangle spin and charge excitations and by this understand more details on uh, the nature of the spin excitations which uh, one is seeing uh, in rigs across the superconducting uh, diagram. Then I will uh, also show you how rigs can uh, probe the high energy spin excitations in iron nictite superconductors uh, and will dive exactly in the topic also what uh, uh, Penjing was, uh, was just mentioning. So we were also doing recently a, a study on the nematic state of D-twin iron selenide which we, with, with, with RIGS, which I will uh, summarize to you. And uh, I will conclude in the last chapter uh, to talk about rare earth nickelates. Uh, and uh, I will show you for this example, how uh, the electron phonon coupling is connected to the metal in cell transition in this kind of negative charge transfer material which has holds actually in the oxygen 2p gigahertz. <clears throat> so resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, what is it? So it's a photon in, photon out spectroscopic technique. So what you do is you uh, choose from your X-ray beam line, the energy of an uh, X-ray beam, which you find uh, the energy 
And you define this energy to certain resonances. That's why it's called resonance, you know, big excess scattering. So what we are particularly powerful in is uh, to engage transition metal 2p to 3 resonance, which are particularly strong. Uh, also uh, for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the 1s to 2p resonance are extremely strong and RIGS is often applied to. And for rare earth materials, often, for instance, also the, the 3d to 4f uh, resonances are very strong. RIGS can also be applied very successfully in fact. So basically, <clears throat> What you do is you inelastically scatter on any kind of condensed matter system, can be a strongly correlated electron system. What we are mostly interested in here now in this talk, or quantum material, um, can be a thin film. That's what uh, Penjing was also explaining. This is the nice uh, advantage that uh, X rays are interacting so strongly with, with matter that you can even study very thin films, can be done on molecules, gases, and so on. <clears throat> so you inelastically scatter this kind of electronic system. So you detect then the uh, uh, re-emitted or inelastically scattered energy with a detector. You engage, of course, the geometry in your experiment <clears throat> by defining the, uh, the incoming and outgoing wave vector. And by this, actually, you can then see how Riggs transfers energy and momentum to the system. You can, by this study, energy loss of particular excitations to the momentum transfer. And by this, Actually, you can study all the elementary excitations in the solid. So it's rigs sense phonons, magnetic excitations, orbital excitations, and charge excitations. So I just show you uh, how, how such a setup is looking. So there is now nowadays around many of these kind of uh, rig spectrometers, uh, uh, very powerful soft X-ray uh, rigs beam lines, which are specialized to soft X-ray rigs. And I show you our spectrometer uh, here, which is like a five meter spectrometer. You can <clears throat> basically say it's a, a kind of Raman spectrometer for X for X rays. So basically, you also have um, a grating sitting in here, and you have a CCD camera. This is nothing else really, like a Raman spectrometer in principle, just optimized for for soft X rays in this case. And um, if you compare it to neutron scattering, uh, I, I, I would say it's uh, simply what what it is is a triple axis uh, spectrometer so we, we basically do a triple axis spectrometer concept for what is heavily applied of course neutron scattering uh, now here with x-rays so and this is the rig spectrometer which we have in, in my group at the address beamline of the swiss light source and is a five meter instrument yeah like i said uh, other instruments uh, in the us and in the uk they're now uh, like 15 meter long and have even higher resolution. So we, we have by, with this still a resolution, which we express here by energy uh, resolving power, and it's energy over the energy resolution of between 10 and 14,000. That means yeah, 10,000 would mean at, uh, at uh, one kilovolt would be a resolution of 100. So basically this is the summary. What can study it. So Riggs is photon in, photon out. You basically excite, um, core electron to the uh, empty conduction band. Then when recombining, uh, when electrons are recombining from the filled balance band, you uh, basically eject this kind of low energy, medium energy. So uh, I want to basically now introduce a little bit uh, more in detail what you can measure with this in or by the example of a spin chain cube rate. So in the early days, uh, when we started with our facility in Switzerland, we were studying this spin chain cube rate, strontium two couple of three. So it's an antiferromagnetic magnetic Heisenberg spin chain. So you, you see it here on the left, you see the crystal structure. And uh, here the, the cartoon shows what it is in principle is the kappa oxygen plaquettes, which are now corner shared connected. So it's a mod. Uh, insulator of charge transfer type, so charge transfer insulator to, to be exact. So it has an electronic configuration 3D9. That means one hole per side, in which is uh, situated in a 3D x square minus square square orbital, and basically uh, all orbitals are, are occupied in the same way. So it's a ferro orbital over that ground state. So so what do you do in Riggs? <clears throat> I explained that you have an incident X-ray beam. So uh, what you choose then is the different excitation energies across the resonance. So I plot here to the right, this TFI is the absorption spectrum. You see here the uh, absorption resonance and you, know, you vary now the incident or here we call it excitation energy 
across this absorption uh, resonance. And uh, what, what you get is in principle many different uh, rig spectra, which we now here connect then uh, to a complete carpet, what we call it often the rig's carpet. And you can see now how the different excitations uh, of the different uh, the excitations of the different degrees of freedom are uh, all resonating actually here for the trivial case of a 3D9 kappa system uh, at the absorption resonance. So you have your spin excitation at low energy, you have orbital excitations, and in that case, DD excitations, you have charge transfer excitations. And if you go far above the resonance, you have also uh, fluorescence, which is just basically an uh, incoherent response of the, of the valence band when you go far above the threshold. So basically, when you don't know any system, <clears throat> how, how it behaves in terms of their excitations, you would normally do uh, in the beginning just an absorption spectrum. You would do then this kind of complete rigs carpet to understand the, what excitations you can resolve and how they resonate. This cube case is very trivial, but if you have multi-electron systems, it could be pretty complicated. And what we were seeing actually then, uh, when we are going with the instant energy to the, the resonance and just make the momentum uh, resolved rigs, we see how uh, now the spin excitations and the orbital excitations are to the surprise at that time uh, behaving momentum dependent. So basically they, they really show uh, collective excitations and uh, in the low energy case, it's actually the, the uh, multi-spin on continuum, the two plus four multi-spin on continuum, which you see here. And uh, for the higher energy, you, you see collective orbital excitations, uh, we, we turn them orbitons. And uh, we understood back in that time that actually the, the way these uh, orbitons are, are behaving collective is, is very similar, uh, connected to um, the spin charge separation mechanism where you P and B um, understand that if you have a spin chain compound and you would eject an electron, you would have a, a create a hole which then can hop along the spin chain. And by this you can create two domain walls, the orbiton, uh, the uh, polon domain wall and the spinon domain wall, which then are uh, basically uh, two separate quasi particles, which can be uh, easily uh, separate from each other that you would see actually, or have seen with ARPAS. And in RIGS, we see this mechanism A, actually where you create by initiating an orbital excitations, you create an orbiton. And when this orbiton uh, pops along the spin chain, you create then an orbiton domain wall and uh, then automatically also the spin on the main walls. You have basically then the separation of the spin and orbital degree of freedom. And this separation process of the two degrees of freedom of this quasi particle just gives them rise to the particular collective behavior of this orbital excitation. So just I show here some more detailed uh, line, anal line shape analysis. So we Analyzed here for the spin on continuum. I mean, yeah, I, I don't need to explain so much uh, on that what the spin on is. Of course, it's a spin one half uh, quasi particle, and uh, <clears throat> how it's created in RIGS is simply that you make a spin, fly, uh, spin flip in the, in the chain, and then basically automatically by bringing the disturbance to the um, and to to the uh, 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 Magnetic uh, uh, interferomagnetic environment, you uh, make make this uh, defect uh, mobile, and by now hopping along the chain, you get simply a two spin on the main one. So, so basically, you see the bound state, right? Spin on bound state. Yeah, you can see the spin on bound state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so this so, is similar to the neutral measurement. I mean, people. This is actually the... actually, and, and that I see in the next. Yeah. So actually, um, we have we have done the same analysis as, as neutron has done, and uh, what, what we have then to, to to show that this is really the two plus four spin on continuum. We, we use um, the the data uh, from Jean Sebastian Co. So he has the spin structure factor of uh, the two plus four spin on dynamical structure factor s of q and omega, uh, numerically analyzed. And we take this numeric data and simply um, broaden them by resolution. And uh, you, 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 you can very nicely see then how you can fully account for all of the spectral waves. Mm -hmm. So it's really proof 
that uh, the, the, this is really uh, just probing exactly the same thing. And then, uh, of course, you need to parameterize then to, to appropriate J, and we, we get actually occasionally out within a millivolt or so accuracy also the, the same um, uh, uh, super exchange uh, parameters as, as the uh, as a neutron paper just a couple of years earlier than we were doing. Can you can you actually get the absolute you know intensity out to, uh, for that to be useful? Because neutron yeah, scattering yeah. can yeah exactly. Okay. I mean this yeah. is exactly that's a good question, right? Neutron scattering can uh, have you you have the uh, understanding on the cross section in, in very great detail, and absolute intensities is extremely difficult for it, right? Okay. So. Uh, we, we are working on that, of course, to become better and better. But what we do normally is then uh, we <clears throat> we need to normalize on some. So we, we uh, often you do normalize on on different uh, spectral features. So we normalize to to one feature and uh, then see the development of other features. So we we need to always kind of find a good way how to normalize things. And uh, in, in addition, actually. Uh, Riggs has the disadvantage that um, it is heavily um, interact. I mean, the X-rays are heavily interacting with matter, right? That has the, uh, the advantage that you can measure very thin films. So you you don't need large quantity of samples. It's the disadvantage on the other side that um, you need to consider, in principle, self-absorption effects. Mm. So so the the beam is is by itself already uh, self-absorbed, just in the way when it the X-rays go into the sample, and even then they escape from the sample again. So you need to really, in the fine detailed analysis, uh, consider all of these things. But but this is relatively well understood now, so we can do all of this. But it is of course cumbersome to do. Okay, and then I just wanted to uh, uh, conclude with this, uh, uh, basically with that message that we then early on uh, uh, by comparing the experiment with the theory understood that we really see this <laughs> orbiton quasi particles by just comparing with uh, a spin orbital model, Kugelkomsky model, which uh, our theory collaborators could then map onto a DJ model and, and really exact uh, solve. <clears throat> and by this, uh, you, you could really show that you have collective orbital excitations, orbitons in the spin and orbital continuum. This is actually then the, the first unambiguous um, the detection uh, of uh, of the orbiton quasi particles, which which we could do. Okay, so th this was now an example where we can study really orbital excitations, collective orbital excitations, or also spin excitations, spin on spin. So just for warming up. So then, of course, Riggs uh, has been studied a lot uh, on uh, the uh, superconducting cube rates, and in particular the whole doped superconducting cube rates. And uh, I show here now an example of how we uh, disentangle the spin and charge excitations um, in such a dope group at superconductor. And this is a collaboration of my group now with uh, theory people from the University of Warsaw, Wolfeld. Uh, samples come from uh, Giannini from, from Geneva, in Geneva in this case. And I want to acknowledge also a collaboration on, on, on an early paper of uh, uh, establishing the, the formalism, how to do this uh, disentanglement with spin and charge contributions within the line shape with the common group. Okay, so how are the spin and charge degrees of freedom in doped cube rates evolve? Of course, here we, we show the, uh, the example of whole doped cube rates. If you dope the holes in the long range antiferromagnetic order uh, um, kappa oxide system, you, um, because the crate here holds, that means these holes can hop along uh, uh, the, the plane. And uh, uh, that means you have two different uh, energy scales, which then are uh, contributing in addition to the super exchange interaction J, have then also the, the kinetic energy, the hopping. And then uh, when you go across superconducting through the phase diagram, you have then uh, different uh, regions where uh, these interaction parameters are uh, uh, contributing differently. So for uh, the region where T is much smaller than J, that means you have the undefined like mod insulator, you are in this part of the phase diagram. If you have now <clears throat> a lot of doping, basically, you have uh, 
a lot of hopping, many hopping paths. Um, you are, are basically xt is much larger than j as you, you go to the Feynman liquid regime. And just in between, where uh, basically t uh, or, or, or the, the, the contributed effect of all hopping uh, contributions are, is in the order of j. You have, of course, superconductivity with other intertwined states like uh, charge density wave order and so on. And exactly this uh, is, of course, the very, very interesting phase where you have magnetic correlations which are coexisting with the well defined quasi particles. And uh, I will show now how, how RIGs can uh, get contributions on the spin and charge excitations in, in this part of the phase diagram. <laughs> So what do we know about spin excitation and cube rates? Of course, we know uh, everything from inelastic neutron scattering, from Penchang and other people, Steve Faden, et cetera, Frank Rada, and so on. So basically, if you now compare inelastic neutron scattering rigs, you have different perspectives. Um, in inelastic neutron scattering, uh, it was, for instance, uh, shown with uh, here the map spectrometer that uh, you, you have actually uh, very, very quickly dropping of a high energy spectral weight with doping. So you, you, you see that basically when you, you uh, increase the doping, your, your high energy spectral weight is uh, basically dropping out more and more. So basically from uh, still a sizable weight for uh, undoped and, and uh, low doped, and then when you get a little bit elevated doping level, it was very, very quickly fading out. On the, on the contrary, you see with RIGS, uh, that you have intense spin excitations all over the phase diagram to the overdoped region. And that means the spectral weight barely changes the doping, as you see here by the by a paper which is done by Dean. So where uh, uh, basically the Lasco system was uh, probed for different doping levels uh, along the phase diagram, and you see kind of within arrow bars nearly no change. So this is really a, a strong uh, contradiction basically between interesting neutron scattering and RIGs. So uh, you see in RIGS, if uh, uh, you, you see now on the left side here for a BISCO system, <coughs> that uh, it, it, when you start off with the, uh, with the long range antiferromagnetic uh, compound, you have, of course, very well defined uh, magnon excitations, spin wave excitations. And um, when you then have uh, a, a sizable doping, now it's an over doped sample here uh, 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 displayed on the right side. From, for this uh, publication of Peng, uh, you, you see that uh, this uh, magnetic action seem to persist, kind of. Mm -hmm. So you, you have kind of still collective spin excitations uh, uh, persisting here, also in the overdoped phase of the phase diagram, but uh, they are significantly damped, so they behave as paramagnons. On the other hand, <clears throat> there was uh, also uh, speculations or even even theory and, and calculations which assign uh, this uh, high energy spectral weight uh, of magnetic character not to spin excitations directly uh, not to magnons or power magnons but actually to rather electron hole pair excitations which are addressed by a spin flip so basically here this is work by the demler group which could explain um, data also i think was probably also data on bisco could basically explain data in the different uh, polarization channels by uh, a theory which just considers electron hole pair excitations and uh, makes a spin flip or not a spin flip. So that means we have here a problem actually when we study rigs because this is kind of at the same time the strength and the curse of rigs that you see all the degrees of freedom uh, kind of uh, with very similar intensities. And then uh, that means uh, at now the, the low energy for, for Rick's energy scale, we see now spin and charge like excitations in the low energy part in the Rick spectra, which are heavily mixing and coupled. And it's very difficult to now understand what's really going on. So, uh, to some degree, this causes doubt, doubt on the uh, real spin excitation origin of this uh, unshaped spectral weight, which I was showing you before. This one. So this what basically the question why is that that spectral weight changing is that really the the, uh, the spin spectral weight which is persisting or is is there some something weird going on which is contributing different uh, parts of contributions from spin and charge correctly 
Okay, so how can you now disentangle in RIGS this uh, spectral wave? So uh, the method we are employing is <clears throat> that we apply the angular and polarization dependence of geometry factor. So because the scattering amplitude in RIGS is contributed of the fundamental scattering amplitude uh, multiplied by angular and polarization dependence. And then actually the orthotic cuprates are straightforward to, to write out the, uh, the geometry factors or, or the scattering tensors for um, elastic scattering, or also charge scattering. It's the, it's the same form for charge and elastic scattering, <coughs> and for magnetic scattering and magnet scattering. Yeah. So, knowing basically these uh, scattering tensors, you then <coughs> can uh, set up uh, what we call asymmetric dependent measurements. So, what you do is you you put your sample on uh, on a wedge, and this wedge is is uh, simply defining a momentum vector. And then you are rotating the ASI mode of, of your sample and do many scattering experiments. And by this, at the end of the day, you uh, basically sample always the same momentum vector, but you sample that momentum vector with different uh, con conditions of um, the incidence uh, and the outgoing polarization. And uh, by, 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 by this, basically, you uh, over-determine the, the problem. So you have many different uh, equations which are contributing. So here's basically the explanation for, the, for these equations. You have for the same energy uh, and given polarization, you have many different azimuthal angles. And uh, basically, all these azimuthal angles are describing the same physics. And in order now to to really uh, understand what contributions you have now in terms of spin spectral weight and charge spectral weight, you can basically analyze that by uh, having uh, overdetermined equation system and numerically solved this. So just uh, sh show basically how these uh, coefficients, uh, uh, which come from scattering tensors, are, are the, the now the depending of, for the spin and the charge part. On, on this asymmodal angles, you can see now that for uh, vertical polarization, horizontal polarization, they have a different asymmodal dependence for the non-spin friction, which is the charge-like scattering, and the spin friction scattering. And then if you do <laughs> plot this uh, for a, a certain energy, we just make it a typical spin excitation energy for cube rate is 250 millivolts. So we just plot it out now here for 250 millivolts. You need to include self-absorption, and then this uh, asymmodal dependence is actually already heavily very, uh, influenced by this. So you need to really take this very much into account. So we do that, and we, <clears throat> we kind of record the following spectra. Now here uh, is a complete map of the experimental spectra we take. We take many rig spectra, which is here energy loss in the vertical, for for all uh, different kind of asymmodal angles. So basically, we do many many rigs experiment for different asymmodal uh, uh, angles, and then um, by this get this overdetermined equation system. And by this, we can uh, simply solve for the uh, spin and charge contribution. So here on the on the right side, I show. Oh, this is going now for the elastic line, zero electron volt. You see the asymmodal dependence of, of our spectral weight. And then and when you um, basically uh, determine the charge and spin contributions, so you see them in red and green. You see the elastic line is, of course, dominated by charge contributions. And if you go now at the typical energy of uh, magnetic acid, 250 millivolt, it, uh, it is for, for this one polarization now contributed both a lot, spin and charge, and also for uh, this horizontal pipe polarization, also spin and charge, you see it contributing. Actually, you see then that in the same energy regime, <clears throat> uh, both spin and charge character are heavily contributed. And that explains why it is so difficult to make this interpretation in terms of persistence of spin excitations and really to understand what's going on. And I show here on the left side, actually, the typical geometries what is used in, in many or most of these spin excitation results, you, which you see in the literature, it's uh, the, the geometry with uh, 
in, in pi polarization. And uh, basically, we, we look at uh, grazing exit geometry, how we call it. So basically, pi polarization, which is corresponding to this azimuth angle 180 degrees. And you can, if you solve the, these equation systems for, for getting out the spin and charge contributions, you see how <clears throat> the spin contribution is dominating, but you have anyway sizable uh, charge contributions. And in, in some publications actually sometimes also used the other configuration where you uh, go in with uh, vertical polarization, the pi, uh, the, the sigma polarization, you can see then how actually for this, it's heavily intermixed, basically. You have nearly the same amount of charge contributing as spin. So it's, it's really difficult to really say what is contributing to, to what degree if you not do this complete uh, disentanglement uh, exercise, which, which we are doing. So we, we do that successful. So I just show you now, <clears throat> finally, a lot of these results for different momentum vectors in pi pi direction and pi direction. You can extract now for uh, an underdoped, an optimal doped, uh, or close to optimal doping, uh, slightly overdoped uh, doping level and a highly overdoped level. You can nicely decompose the spin spectral weight and, and determine this experimentally. Mm -hmm. and you can see that uh, on pi pi direction and on a pi pi direction is a little bit asymmetric. So you have uh, a, a, a steeper uh, intensity rise actually in the pi pi direction and then in the pi zero direction. If you compare the charge uh, spectral function, it looks in the pi zero direction actually qualitatively similar, but uh, in the pi pi direction actually is, is saturating very quickly. So it's really behaving mu much different in the, uh, in the brilliant zone uh, compared to the uh, spin structure of the factor. So basically with this, we, we can get out all of the different spin and charge uh, contributions on the low energy spectral wave. And I just plot that here on the left side, actually, is effectively the comparison between spin and charge. So in, in pi zero direction behaves very similar. And in pi pi direction, you, you see that the, the spin is like dominating over, over the charge contribution. We were now comparing this intensity development, which we we really accurately got by uh, decomposing with the spin, the spin and charge contribution of the low energy excitations with um, calculations done with density matrix now renormalization group simulations on a TG like model on a square lattice. And uh, actually, our theory collaborators get their simulations exactly the, the same uh, intensity development in details. Yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, yeah, really remarkable that uh, that one can 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 get this thing out. Um, and actually, it would be very difficult if you now compare normal Riggs data without having done the disentanglement. You cannot make this kind of um, uh, um, comparison to, to to advanced theory because uh, you, uh, you would have basically the spectral weight you're comparing with is totally mixed between spin and charge. And uh, it would be extremely difficult. So, so basically, our disentanglement uh, method now uh, enables accurate comparison to high-level theory. And uh, our theory collaborators were doing this kind of DMIG calculations, not just for the uh, T T prime T double prime J model, but also uh, only the T T prime and uh, also the simple T J model. And uh, co compare all, all of this, and uh, uh, basically what, what what they can see is that the TJ model is already for the qualitative uh, development accounting, but uh, more, more accurate accounting you have if you take a TT prime, T double prime model, and very important because they can do real space approach because they can, uh, since of, of course DMIG is a real space approach, they can decide uh, up to where they are summing. So they, they basically looked how far they need to sum in order to, to make the, uh, the, the reasonable description of the spectrum. And it came out actually that if they sum up to the third neighbors, you know, they can have a reasonable agreement with our experiment. And uh, it's kind of converging and not changing any much more if they go even more far. 
So basically what I have shown here as a, a first illustration of the power of rigs is how you can um, disentangle the, the mixed spin and charge excitation in rigs in the super and Bisco. Um, how uh, I show how they have momentum and doping dependence. Um, I show that actually spin and charge excitation show distinct, distinct momentum dependence. And uh, a comparison of DMG simulation suggests now that indeed this, uh, to some degree, uh, speculated uh, uh, or suggested um, persistence of short range magnetic durations is indeed happening and is responsible for the persistence of the spin excitation, which is claimed and seen since long time now, uh, more than a decade in, in various uh, spin excitations paper on, on uh, those tube rates up to the high doping level. This implies really the short range paramagna nonic nature of the of the spin excitation. Okay, so I, I come now to the second topic, which is iron-based superconductors. And uh, here we'll uh, basically uh, tackle a little bit both actually iron nickel superconductors and also iron selenide. This is now a collaboration between my group and the group of Jingye Lu at uh, Beijing Normal University. And we also collaborate heavily uh, in the project now with Shima Shi and uh, the Peng Chen. So basically it's joint work of, of Jingye, Shima, Peng Chen and me. So, and, uh, I set out with just reminding us what pneumatic order means in real space and in momentum space. On the left side, <clears throat> I show the typical spin uh, structure of actually barium iron isolate, for instance. So basically you have in uh, one direction, you have uh, ferromagnetic line spins and in the other direction, antiferromagnetic line spins. That means you have uh, in real space, uh, you have a breaking of rotational symmetry. That means inequivalence in X direction and Y directions. Now here in the uh, iron plane or iron asthmine plane. So what does it mean in magnetic, in terms of the magnetic susceptibility? So if you are <clears throat> now below the pneumatic transition, you have uh, clearly then a different response of the magnetic susceptibility, uh, depending on if you're uh, along the pi zero direction or if you're in the zero pi direction. Clearly, we go and of course uh, above the pneumatic transition temperature, uh, then uh, of course you are mixing up these magnetic configurations, you're scrambling up this, and basically you, you, you will see in both directions, pi zero and, and zero pi the same. So basically, you don't have this rotational symmetry breaking. So we were now attacking iron selenide, which is a very interesting system because see here to the left side. So uh, it, it is uh, consisting out of iron selenide planes. So iron is in uh, oxidation at two plus, selenide in uh, two minus. So that is a structural pneumatic transition 90 Kelvin. Uh, what is very interesting is that it actually has no long range magnetic order. So, so basically it is uh, more like a liquid state. TC is eight Kelvin in the bulk, but can be pushed up in thin films, uh, in particular on thin films on uh, strontium titanate to uh, 70K or so, it's highly tunable. So um, there uh, has been many uh, studies also by STM, an early study by STM was showing that actually the, we have orbital selective Cooper pairing here because you have un unastorated uh, superconductive energy gaps, which can extract by STM. Now it's the question, how <clears throat> is this cinematic uh, transition manifesting, and uh, I show that here in uh, from overview papers here from Aldea. And uh, uh, what, what you see is that for, for un, uh, undergoing the across the pneumatic transition, it means between tetragonal and pneumatic state or pneumatic state without the autorhombic phase, you have uh, developing across this pneumatic transition and uh, resistivity and un anisotropy. Basically, you have. Uh, different resistivity uh, 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 along A or B direction. So uh, you get, of course, uh, an autorhombic distortion uh, at this uh, uh, transition temperature. You have pneumatic susceptibility plotted here, which is diverging and approaching this pneumatic uh, transition temperature. And of course, in line with this, between the tetragonal and autorhombic pneumatic state, 
you have uh, significant uh, uh, changes in the farmer cells. So now is the question, what is the origin of this uh, electronic uh, nematicity? So it might be either orbital or spin driven, because it's kind of not settled. Um, you know, in addition, it is interesting to see what correlations uh, uh, and uh, inter or basically crosstalk or interplay you have between magnetic adaptations, <coughs> nematicity, and superconductor. <laughs> and of course, here also who who uh, is, is often first is of course of neutron scattering, but also uh, now NMR. So actually, NMR, the, the group of Büchner was uh, uh, in 2014 already studying uh, iron selenide, and they looked at the, the spin relaxation rates, uh, which uh, did not show any uh, anomaly uh, corresponding to the structural or nematic transition. So they interpret this that um, the, um, the nematicity might be driven by orbital uh, scenario. So nematicity might be driven by, uh, by the orbitals. So um, the, uh, there was uh, papers by Wang et al, which uh, showed a res uh, early on the, the spin resonance mode uh, with inelastic neutron scattering. Uh, and so they, they saw how the spin resonance mode is, is also um, are related to superconducting uh, temperature. Basically, you, you see it building out here in the superconducting phase, and uh, you have it suppressed uh, when crossing the superconducting transition, and you have it basically uh, extinguished when uh, being in a normal phase. So the, this uh, uh, low energy spinning such as the resonance mode has, uh, by this the characters on the PC. And what was then interesting and connected to um, Nematicity is actually, if you now plot the, uh, the low energy the spin structure factor response um, as a function of temperature, and you overplot the uh, autorhombic distortion basically on top of it, you see that this uh, autorhombic distortion has the same onset temperature, nam namely the structural transition temperature, as um, the, the onset temperature for uh, this very low energy spin excitation. So it means you have a strong interplay between the 2.5 millivolt spin excitations and the nematic transition <clears throat> temperature. And that immediately suggests that you have spin, that the spin fluctuations could be actually connected to electronic nematicity. So for these measurements, then we're speaking for the spin difference. So they were going on in more detailed measurements where they, they saw uh, in iron selenide, uh, what they call needle type and stripe type uh, spin excitations in different parts of, of the brilliant zone. I see that actually you have a competition between these uh, stripe and needle type spin excit uh, excitations across the nematic transition. And actually, they found that in the autorhombic nematic state, you have a favoring of uh, stripe excitations. You see that here. At low temperature, you have more more dominance of the stripe type spin excitations. And uh, in the high energy uh, parametric tetragonal state, you have uh, clearly strong enhancement of the needle type excitations. So then uh, what came next in, in this, which was kind of revolu revolutionary. So what Penchang already uh, uh, summarized in the very beginning, actually uh, his group uh, together with Jing Lu, they were uh, developing how one can nicely <clears throat> now detwin iron selenide, which is not so easy because iron selenide is, is, is quite soft. So if you try to just uh, detwin it by, by applying pressure on it directly with a detwinning device, which just works with a screw and uh, pressurizes it in a unidirectional uh, kind of uh, a screw device or something like that, uh, it, it is not easy at all. But uh, was Pen Cheng's group and the Jingye, they were very smart and discovered that you can just glue the iron selenide and barium iron arsenide. You can detwin barium iron arsenide and by this uh, indirectly detwin iron selenide. <laughs> you, you see that how they were doing that with the neutrons. They uh, uh, show in the in their in a nice paper here and from 2019, the Nature Materials, that uh, the detwinning ratio which you can uh, measure with nuclear practice is like around 50% even. 
That means uh, the autocomplete distortion of 0.36% uh, is enough to uh, now uh, transfer the, the detwinning basically from the iron uh, barium iron arsenide onto the glued iron selenide. And uh, by this, you can now nicely detwin iron selenide in the indirect way and uh, uh, studying now a uh, nematicity effect in this compound. And that's what they have done in this paper as well, <clears throat> where they're seeing now uh, a strong anisotropic spin resonance behavior, both actually in the normal state and in the superconducting state. So, so basically both normal and superconducting state are heavily behaving anisotropic. So that's very interesting. And as you can see, see that here as a function of energy. So uh, for all energies, basically, <clears throat> you, you have a clear difference between the one zero and zero one direction. And uh, all of these results together were interpreted with spin fluctuation driven <clears throat> orbital selective Cooper pairing in line actually with this STM early work. So now is the question, of course, how can you now look at the high energy spin excitation? With neutrons, it was very easy to, to study now the low energy spin excitations, but the, the problem now is um, how to study the high energy excitations because if you do this trick of indirectly detwinning, you um, have the barium iron arsenide sitting below the iron selenide, and uh, you have then an overlapping spin excitation uh, uh, response between the two compounds. If you uh, do that with a very volume sensitive technique like inelastic neutron scattering, and basically you cannot understand what, what is really the high energy spin excitation response from the iron selenide. So uh, the question is then how now is the evolution of the high energy spin excitations across the matic transition? And of course, what can answer this is, of course, rest inelastic X ray scattering. And um, I'm just showing you how this is working now. Uh, for the reference compound barium iron arsenide, where we had a paper already nearly a decade back. Uh, you see here the absorption spectrum of barium iron arsenide. You basically tune your instant energy at this absorption resonance and you take this Rick spectra. And the response now <clears throat> is like that, that the dominating response is here this, we call it the fluorescence rhyme, which is basically just the large overlap or the hybridization between the iron 3D and arsenide orbitals. So it means it's a really itinerant kind of response of the electronic structure of the, of the D electrons. And um, in terms of the low energy physics, this is not so interesting and actually it can be a problem. But um, for our positive surprise is that when you look next to the elastic line, you see low energy excitations next to the elastic line. You zoom in here. It's clearly low energy excitations, which could be spin excitations. And when we were doing initially now the, um, the cuts in the brilliant zone on, on pi zero, pi phi direction, you, you were seeing that these low energy excitations are indeed uh, behaving collective. So they have a, a certain momentum dependence. And we, we quickly learned how actually one can parameterize the electronic structure response. You can basically fit this 3D fluorescence lines. And uh, basically what it is, is you have a fluorescence response and you have here an electron hold pair response. And uh, if you model this in a reasonable, accurate way, you can uh, kind of subtract out the electronic background or the electronic response of the, of the system and extract the magnetic response, which had been just done here on the right side. So the blue response is now, to a large degree, the, the pure spin excitation response. We have just plotted here, just below, basically in pi zero and pi pi direction, we have clearly dispersing spin excitation. So further support that this really spin excitation is that you can just fit it, a typical line shape of dynamical spin system to do. So we were seeing then, by, by looking at different uh, hold up Compounds. So, in addition to the parent compound, we looked at an underdoped, optimal doped, and overdoped compound. You will see that all of them have uh, a nice dispersing spin excitations. And you see that clearly <clears throat> these uh, high energy spin excitations are getting softened for an increasing amount of hold of doping. So, basically, you have a very similar situation as in the cuprate superconductors. You also have the persistence of the spin excitations across the the, the phase diagram, and uh, 
you, you can probe these uh, uh, excitations also in the complementary way uh, to university neutral scheduling exactly like for, for, for Q breaks. Okay, so I, I return now to the main topic of, of this uh, second chapter, uh, which is iron selenide. So I said, okay, we want to basically understand now how <clears throat> these uh, high energy spin excitations are changing across the pneumatic transition temperature. Um, we do that with RIGS. We do it exactly in the same way as we learned from our neutron partners. So we, uh, we, we glue now the iron selenide directly on barium iron arsenide and uh, basically D twin uh, in this setup, which you can put nicely in our rig spectrometer, the barium iron arsenide, which is then is D twinning iron selenide. So let's look at the evolution of the high energy spin excitations uh, seen with the rig cross section across the pneumatic transition. So that's first we see iron selenide pure. How, how this is responding, so iron selenide here is the absorption spectrum. We, we do basically the sp uh, uh, rig spectra uh, across this absorption resonance. You, you see here the, the rig's carpet where you see um, around the uh, uh, absorption resonance of 2p to 3d, you have uh, enhancement of the low energy excitation. So this is the spin excitation, magnetic excitation for high energy uh, fluorescence, and then this fit can nicely now account for the fluorescence. Well, I, I show you also for the barium ionized reference case. You can uh, basically describe your elastic line. And by now knowing the fluorescence response, fitting out your elastic line, you can then fit the rest of the spectrum <clears throat> to damp harmonic oscillator has been done here. And by this, you, you can now determine our spin spectral weight and uh, uh, make detailed analysis on the spin spectral weight just with uh, the harmonic oscillator shape. So here I just show <clears throat> as the first step the, the, the reference of the D-twin barium iron isonite. You see that uh, when you have D-twin the barium iron isonite, you have a, a clear anisotropy between the uh, pi zero and, and uh, zero pi direction. And you, you have then for pi pi direction, you have also very, very strong spin wave uh, excitations. And actually, when you now <clears throat> compare this experimental result to uh, either a uh, extended Heisenberg model, you have a reasonable agreement. Or also, if you compare it to an RPA plus U calculation, you have a reasonable description basically for, for this high energy spin excitations along the uh, to uh, crystal axis A and B when you have twin these barium arsenide uh, single crystal. Okay, so we then turn to iron selenide. We just do the detuning of that. And you see here on the left side how you have very strong uh, spin excitation anisotropy at high energy between the pi zero and, and zero pi direction. You have also strong spin excitations uh, along pi pi. Uh, that means uh, this unnecessary spin excitations on D-twin iron selenide are on an extremely high energy scale. Actually, it's around 200 millivolts. And uh, one should remark that this is energy scale, which is much higher than actually the splitting of the um, orbital levels. So the DX set, the Y set splitting is uh, significantly smaller, it's much smaller than 100 millivolts. So we see here then an unambiguous ev evidence of high energy hematic. Uh, spin coordinations for, for iron selenide, which uh, would be extremely difficult to, to determine with uh, in elastic neutron scattering. With RIGS, is kind of very straightforward. So we need to do a detailed analysis now of, of the um, integrated intensities, and uh, we do uh, also detailed analysis of uh, the anisotropy. You, you see that it, uh, it is maximized close to the, the maximum uh, achievable momentum vector. But um, more interesting is actually now to see how this anisotropy is changing as a function of temperature. And then we, we did that. We see that actually for both iron selenide and barium iron arsenide, this uh, spin excitation anisotropy is uh, basically decreasing as a function of uh, increasing uh, temperature and is actually fading away a little bit above the uh, structural dynamic. 
um, transition temperature. So um, in, the, in the last slide of this study, we, we just show now calculations done by uh, uh, Shi, uh, where he was calculating uh, S, and, uh, S of Q for an anti-ferromagnetic quadrupolar phase. And uh, we compared it actually to our fitted experimental rigs results at low energy, basically the fitted experimental spin excitations. You, you see that uh, now this uh, antiferro quadrupolar phase calculation is very well representing actually um, what, what is going on in the experiment. So you, you, you really capture very nicely this um, spin excitation anisotropy for, for the different uh, momentum transfer vectors. Both capturing nicely for this pi zero, uh, zero pi anisotropy, and also captures actually what's going on in the, in the pi pi direction. So, so what this shows is actually that uh, here a local moment based picture describes now the nematicity of iron selenide um, very well, in addition actually to, to other itinerant approaches which were uh, done, uh, I, I think also by Hirschfeld and, and Anderson, I think they have them. actually recently also published a paper uh, de describing actually our experimental data in a, in a more itinerant approach. That uh, means that actually you can now uh, des describe this starting off from both directions, uh, which is then basically now a question which, which uh, is, is the more appropriate way now to describe it, a local moment way, which uh, uh, you, you, you also add maybe itinerancy or you begin with energy approach and you you add self energy effects, but uh, uh, obviously both approaches work. Okay, so I summarize now <clears throat> this chapter of the uh, of this overview talk. So we, we have studied the spin excitation with rigs on detrain iron sand and iron arsenide. We actually uh, observed that the spin excitation are mostly under them. The magnitude of the spin excitation in iron sand is actually comparable. To uh, barium iron isonide, which is having actually uh, uh, SDW, which uh, has a, 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 a clearly uh, a spin ordering at low temperature. The energy scale is above 200 millivolt. That means very much larger than the X set, Y set orbital splitting. And this, this spin excitation and high energy, uh, this anisotropy of the spin excitation and high energy disappears actually above the nematic transition. So that means we see clearly that this RIGS and this nematics high energy spin correlations. And uh, our interpretation is that this nematicity in iron selenide is uh, because of uh, this behavior of uh, energy scale higher than the orbital splitting and uh, um, the disappearance of spin excitations above the structural or nematic transition. We, we think that the primary driver is actually the spin. Okay, so now I come to the last chapter of my overview talk, which is the um, rare earth nickelate family. So actually, how much time I have to? Yeah, you, no you're, you're, you're very little time. Oh. Yeah, basically no time. Yeah, maybe you can hmm? do, do, do. You have basically no time. You can uh, say quickly, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So I I I, I can uh, uh, just summarize the the essence of it. Huh? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so basically, what we've done here is. Uh, a metal ins uh, insulator transition uh, uh, a family of rare earth nickelates, which uh, uh, are famous for either having a charge disproportionation mechanism between nickel three plus to a small deviation for it, or a bond disproportionation. Mm -hmm. And uh, bond disproportionation would be if you have actually all of the nickel ions being in two plus, and the action is happening then only on the ligands. So, and we were now trying to show if we can see this actually from Riggs, and that's what we actually could do. I just jump here and see that. Um, so we were comparing um, basically uh, uh, Riggs maps in the insulating state uh, and in a metallic state. And now by the development of the different excitations, we 
you can really see what's going on in, the, in terms of the electronic configuration at nickel mm -hmm. and how it's interplaying with oxygen. The DD excitation actually not change at all and they look very D8-like. So that actually confirms this D8 nickel configuration and, and not D7 nickel. Then you, you see that the difference above the met, uh, across metal insulator transition is uh, mostly just in between the DD excitation response and the fluorescence or charge response, which uh, actually connects actually that the, the, uh, the changes are mostly connected to oxygen. And, and that actually then connects that but the, uh, the oxygen ligand band is really the the, more, the mainly involved uh, electronic contributor in the metal insulator transition. And then what I wanted to show in the last part is basically that you can with rigs now, if you go at oxygen K edge, you can nicely, I think I just showed this one, and nicely study now the phonon excitation as well. And then this now uh, in the system where you, you think that the oxygen is the, uh, the heavily uh, uh, involved uh, ele uh, electronic part of, uh, of the system, which is determining the metal insulator transition and the, and the physics, you um, can probe at oxygen K takes very nicely the phonons. And uh, the, the, the phonons should then uh, change dramatically over the metal insulator transition. We do that here, you see that we can both resolve the breathing mode and the uh, octahedral distortion mode need to fit that in a complicated way and make a long long story short, we have then different development <clears throat> depending if you have now a nickelate, like neodymium nickelate, which is undergoing a metal insulator transition where you have then basically two sets of phonon responses below and, up, uh, and above the metal insulator transition or samarium nickelate, which is not undergoing a metal insulator transition, which is just continuously uh, evolving or lanta nickelate, which is always metallic instead of some marine nickelate, which is insulating, which is basically has no, no changes as functional. So basically what, what we see now in this overview is that <clears throat> the phonon um, is heavily changing or even mm. we, we can qu quantify the uh, electron phonon coupling constants, uh, M or, or G uh, and uh, quantify the change of the electron phonon coupling as a function of temperature. And what we see actually is that um, the, um, the uh, electron phonon coupling uh, constant uh, decreases by about 25% when you go at, at the MIT. That means it decreases already, not exactly at the MIT, but already before the MIT. Mm. So, so basically, uh, what you have is that you have uh, a situation where the electron phonon cutting uh, a reduction is preceding the MIT. So by this, it's a, a clear scenario that actually the breathing mode uh, phonon often uh, in the near nucleate case here decreases just below MIT already. Uh, that means you have a disappearance of the breathing lattice distortion which is then kind of the precursor for the electronic metal insulator transition. It mean, means really the, <clears throat> the uh, breathing distortion and uh, but, 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 but by this, this, this uh, bond uh, uh, environment, which is stationing this, this uh, uh, bond distortion mechanism is really the driver for the metal that's, that's the story about it. Okay, and this is the summary. I show you rigs which probe spin excitations, charge excitation, orbital excitations, and phonon excitations in the different uh, quantum materials. I give you the example of dispersive orbitons in the spin chain comparate. I show you for whole dope cuprate how we can uh, disentangle spin and charge excitations. Um, I show you uh, the persistence of spin excitations in whole doped iron plictides. I uh, show you how uh, we could recently observe strong pneumatic spin excitation anisotropy in at a relatively large energy scale above orbital splitting in iron selenide. I show you how you can analyze the rare earth nickelate uh, uh, as a negative charge transfer material, but yeah, not in detail, just in a short form. And 
I show you how one can probe phonon excitations with RICs. And by this, uh, basically, uh, study interactions between uh, phonon excitations and, uh, for instance, a metal insulator transition in this case. And uh, in this case of the rare nickelate, we saw that actually you have electron phonon coupling decreasing as a precursor for the MI. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, any question? Let me let me ask you a first question. You know, I'm uh, so very curious. So, can RICs actually see stoner continuum? I mean, there's a story, you know, for metals. I mean, for, for many, many years, right? People wanted to see stoner continuum. And neutron scattering always have a problem of, uh, you know, looking above 100 millivolts or 200 millivolts. It's very, very difficult. You know, for any sort of metals, for iron, nickel, you know, uh, whatever, has there been any evidence for that? From, from no, I, 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 I think you, 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 you can see this kind of things of stoner continuum. I mean, it's basically connected to what, what I was showing you uh, that, that, for instance, for the whole dope cube rates, you need this disentangled spin and charge excitations. Right, right. To, to, to now really resolve then this, this stoner continuum uh, excitations for any kind of this uh, more itinerant uh, uh, magnetic materials. Um, you, you would simply need uh, what you would need to do then again, uh, in many cases, if you're not lucky that um, some charge excitations or fluorescence are begin to overlap there, mm. you would need to do this disentanglement. I mean, in the situation where uh, you, you are lucky that it's not overlapping with this fluorescence or other high energy uh, uh, excitations or, or medium energy excitations, you would see that right away. But it, you, you will often, I think, end up in a situation where the simply is overlapping. And in order to, to resolve it and to really disentangle it, you will need to do exactly this kind of analysis as I was demonstrating here now for the e easy, okay. <laughs> already okay. easy case of uh, the hold of cube rate. But for, for, for other multi electron systems, it might be much more difficult. Okay, so let me, let me there are two questions actually. Uh, first question is from Andreas. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes. So, um, I mean, let me ask a question that connects two of your um, your summaries, namely the question, have you looked at the interplay between uh, charge and spin fluctuations also in the iron based materials? No, I mean, no, no, not exactly, actually, yeah. because uh, <laughs> this is actually, uh, yeah, so, so I think in a quality difficult to do or yeah, it's more difficult this is exactly what i say right uh, to uh, to to do this uh, calculation uh, uh, in the multi electron system is, is much more difficult than uh, for the um, uh, one electron system i mean you you need to understand the cube rate is a d9 problem so it's one hole so uh, i see so so, so then uh, guessing so the quantum mechanics mathematics is very trivial and for for um, multi-band uh, basically right yeah multi-band system right multi-electron system it is more difficult so so to to uh, yeah we, we we did not succeed to to, to derive <laughs> reasonable scattering tensors right so if you uh, can derive the scattering tensor you can exactly uh, do this kind of uh, analysis like done with the cube rates with the asymodal uh, dependence and uh, you you would be able to understand it. But uh, yeah. so we, we, we tried to motivate a theoretician to do it. So no, so far, no, no theoretician wanted to do it. Well, Andreas, you, you're probably a volunteer, right? So it is it's just a problem, you know, it's, it's a, for most normal experimenters like me, is a little bit too tough, and 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 maybe for many theoreticians to to derive this kind of uh, smart way, the scattering tensor for a complicated multi-electron system is probably too boring. So I don't know. Uh, so far, we didn't did not succeed to motivate somebody. We we, we continuously try. But, but okay. So, so so maybe you get interested or you you know somebody. <laughs> I, I think it would be great for the community to motivate somebody. So, so there's another question online uh, by by Igor basically asking in bismuth two two one two, bismuth uh, strontium copper oxide. Yeah, how is the contradiction in spin fluctuation versus whole doping between neutron? Yeah, basically he's asking you know uh, the question. This question also I wanted to ask right. But basically the neutron look at pi pi. You look at the gamma gamma right gamma point. Yes, yes. So, so, so it's, it's really, you, you don't really, I mean, Chonghuada always asks this question, right? you don't seem to, you know, 
uh, you, you don't really have a sort of a symmetry, right, in dope system between- No, no, sure. I mean, we-, yeah, we, so we how, how do you address that? Yeah. I mean, of course, we, 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 we cannot address it, right? So the, the, this is, of course, part of the, uh, uh, of the uh, discrepancy between neutrons and, and uh, Higgs, which one can uh, simply not solve, I think, because, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, of course, uh, for uh, the, the dope cube rate, we, we cannot um, um, assume that the gamma point and pi pi is the same, right? So, right. In the parent compound, you can. I mean, in the, in yeah, the, in the in parent, the, we can. Yeah, but, right. but the, once you and, dope, and actually, you, in, the, in, in the parent, you have seen that they are really uh, absolutely equivalent. Mm -hmm. yeah, for, for the parent compound, is really well understood, absolutely equivalent, and uh, the Rix data, uh, when when compared, uh, I think there there is data uh, of neutron from Hayden uh, from right, right, right. The, the data done uh, from us, and then even better data from newer machines which were really uh, kind of one-to-one -one com compared and uh, 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 kind of the cross-section, uh, unknown cross-section of Riggs was determined by, by fitting to the neutrons and then it, it could be really explained one-to-one. -one. Right, right. So, th so there's another question. So hey, uh, Torsten, so is there an obvious reason why electron phonon coupling constant would be so strongly temperature dependent in the necklace? That's actually a very good question. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it seems strange, right? How can you have the electron phonon coupling change? I mean, how many level have you seen the phonon shift? I, I, I forgot the, 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 the energy scale that you, you did. No, the, 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 the phonon shift is not so much, actually. So you see so, intensity change or what, what do you, how so, do you conclude? So, uh, exactly, yeah. it is mostly, yeah, exactly. Here, this is intensity change, yeah? Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically, uh, the, the rigs basically, is giving rise to, I spool back what I could not say. Basically, in principle, in the easy picture, Riggs uh, can see the phonons. And this is now kind of a molecular solid, uh, like an ideal solid. Right, right. And then depending how many overtones in the phonon you, you can see, you can get a kind of a quantification of magnitude of the electron phonon coupling. So basically, the, the more phonon spectral weight and, uh, and the more higher overtones uh, it is now contributing, the higher is the electron phonon coupling constant. So you can measure this oh, up. And uh, of course, this is now a molecular solid uh, ideal uh, picture. This is already a more realistic picture where uh, by this theoretician, uh, Gilmore, he, he, he was coupling two phonon modes, phonon mode of 50 millivolts with a phonon of 100 millivolts, so it's two different phonons in the system. You can see then what, um, by the interference of the two phonons, to, to what kind of mass or phonon response you can get. So and then the analysis becomes tougher and tougher, but you can quantify this, and that's what we have done. You can quantify the electron phonon coupling. So have this been confirmed by neutron scattering? I mean, 50 millivolts is quite easy to do with neutrons as well, right? Have people looked at this as well with neutrons to see this phonon softening? Or whatever this intensity change? Uh, I, I not that I know. Of. Okay. Uh, but I, I might have missed it. Okay. But uh, um, it, it, it is simply we are very very strong in this. To, uh, yeah, we are very strong in, uh, in coupling to optical phonons. So we we basically can very much. So so basically, uh, the the reason we see phonons is the electron phonon coupling, <laughs> because in principle, Rix is. Uh, is probing charge property, right? Right, right, right. So, so, so basically, if you then just understand that, it's clear that the more intensity you 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 resolve, you you have a at least a proper proportional way of, of measuring the electron phonon. Okay, I guess the key question was: do do you actually understand the the, the microscopic reasons as why? It's so I, I think the microscopic reason is. That uh, in these rare nickelates, you have exactly, you know, they have this, this strong structural uh, transition across the metal insulator transition. Okay. Because you have uh, uh, in the um, metallic state, you have uh, all of the nickel O6 uh, octahedra, you have uh, all of them the same. And when you go now in the uh, what they call the bond disproportionated phase, you have now uh, alternating. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, uh, a, a, a compressed or, or, or extended octahedra, mm -hmm. 
And that is exactly this, this breathing mode uh, reconstruction. And uh, this breathing mode reconstruction is actually then corresponding to, to actually uh, also a phonon. That's the breathing mode phonon, simply. That's one of the optical phonons. And exactly this one has now this very strong uh, change in the electron phonon coupling across the metal and strange transitions. So basically, it's now uh, basically a connection with the, from the structure to the phonon and then to the electronic structure. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this is very mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah, if there's no more question, yeah, that, that's a thank you, Torsten again. Torsten again. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah the, 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 sorry that I couldn't finish the, the nickelates so completely. But yeah. yeah, people, people, people's attention span don't exceed, you know, more than one hour, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's totally okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Tosin. Yeah, bye. Thanks Thank a lot. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have a nice day, everybody. Huh? Bye. Yeah. Good night. Yeah, bye. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.